What is it that, that really is the foundation um, for what we want to hold to and understand so that we can grow faithfully as Christians and as a church to God? And, and the reason that he was so taken back that this person's official pastoral sermon be up here simply because so many young guys go to seminary and they really invest their time in knowing God's word. And in church discipline is something that is important. And so they just, they come out of seminary gun ho and they just come in and want to clear the rolls and rebuke everyone. And, and, and thankfully for me, I think if, if this was happening, you know, 15 years ago, I, I might've come in and act like that. But thankfully um, for you at least, God's allowed me to get a little older and, and wiser and some of that. And so we're not looking to come in and just shake things up this morning. But there's this, this reason that, that many pastors do this, and that's because I think what we see is that discipline in the church is for two primary reasons. And I'm going to use a couple different words to describe this, but happiness and holiness, right? Uh, we, we see discipline in our family, right? We probably have seen families that lack discipline, and they're not necessarily happy places. Right? And so, so discipline is for the happiness and the holiness of the church. Now, when we think about holiness, uh, we often have a, a couple different ideas. And sometimes it just comes to the idea of, of righteousness, of, of, of purity, not having sin. Now, it's interesting that holiness is the word here that we, we see that is described of the Lord. Isaiah 6. This is a familiar passage to us, right? Now, in the Bible, whenever a word is repeated, it's done so to show the emphasis, right? And notice here this language of Isaiah in chapter 6, starting in verse 1. It says, in the year of King Uzziah, uh, Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet and two he flew and one called to the other and said holy 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 is the lord of hosts the whole earth is full of his glory and the foundation of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called and the house was filled with smoke and i said woe is me for i am lost for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. So Isaiah is given this, this really wonderful vision of, of this heavenly realm and the things that are taking place there. And he hears the angels and the pronouncement that God is holy, holy, holy. And we might have that his heart would have been filled with gladness, that he had been given this opportunity to experience something that, that we likely won't until our days on earth have ended. And yet, what was his pronouncement? He, he pronounced judgment upon himself. He pronounced woe upon himself. At the, at the vision of God's holiness, he called for his own judgment to take place. Why? Because he was a man of unclean of uncleanness. God is a holy God. And this idea of holiness means that he is completely other from us, that he is radically different from us. He alone is God as creator. We are but mere creatures. And yet we see that even though he is radically holy and radically different from us in these ways, yet in grace he is imminent with us. He is personal with us. He is loving towards us. Now, where do we see the holiness of God most powerfully demonstrated? Oftentimes, in churches today, we want to lift up God as a God of love. And we see that in 1 John. God is love. And we don't want to take away from that. But sometimes we do so to this extent that we ignore the holiness of God. And if we said, where do we see God's love? We would say, in the death of his son, the sinner. That's how we know that God loves us. God demonstrated his love for us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But how do we know that God is 
holy. We know he is holy because Christ died for us. Christ, God rather, could not just forgive sins, ignore sins. This is one of the great errors of those who follow the teaching of Muhammad, the Muslim. They think God can just freely forgive at whatever he wants. They even bolster this up to show why, 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 why Islam is greater than Christianity, but they are faulty in their understanding. A God of righteousness cannot just forgive sin. There must be restitution. And in the cross, we see that God is both, yes, loving, and he is righteous and just. He is holy. And yet, it's so interesting that, that preachers like me stand the pulpit and will proclaim, Jesus died for your sins. And I pray that you as those whom God gives pastors who equip you for the work of ministry, that you're going out in your circles of influence and you're saying, repent, put your faith in Jesus. Jesus died for sins. And yet, sometimes we lack this hatred for sin. When I was going to my ordination council now some weeks ago, that was what one of the pastors asked me. He said, on a scale of 1 to 10, how much do you hate sin? And I was honest, there are times when I just really hate sin. Like as a teacher, I, I see my students and what they're going through with parents' divorce. We know that God hates divorce and it just tears these families apart and it hurts them so much. I mean, in those moments, I mean, my hatred of sin is so great, right? But in other times, I don't hate sin that much. But especially with my own sin, I'm frustrated with my children. And I know that the anger is wrong and that the anger of man will never accomplish the righteousness of God. I don't hate it as much then. But, but we need to be a people who absolutely, with everything in us, hate sin. My children have unfortunately learned to use the, the hate word the wrong way. And they'll use it with each other or with things that they ought not to really hate. And so I, I want to teach them, don't use that word. Don't use that word. But there is a time when Christians use that word. And we should be those who hate sin. We should hate sin in our own lives. We should hate sin in our churches. I want us to understand that sin, and we'll look at this later when we go through 1 Corinthians 5, I want us to understand that sin is a disease. Sin is a cancer. I want you to think about everything that we've done in the last year, little over a year, to sort of mitigate and fight COVID-19. Think of all of the steps that we've taken as individuals and societies. I mean, we completely isolated ourselves for a time. I mean, my, my little family, we were, we were locked in our homes. Not only for our sake, I wasn't too worried about what might happen to us, but, but my aunt and uncle, and my aunt who lives with them, they're, they're getting a little older in age, and we were terrified that, that maybe we would have it and not know it, and we would take it to them, and, and then they would die from it. And we were willing to sort of lock ourselves in the home. And they were like, no, come, come swim. And I was like, okay, but we get in the pool, and then you guys can come outside. Never can we be close enough to touch uh, there needs to be big distances there. Why? Because we were afraid of infecting them. We cared about them so much. We loved them so much. We didn't want anything to happen to them. We wore masks for a year to protect each other. Sin is more deadly and more destructive than COVID-19. And if we're willing to take those sort of measures for a virus, how much more should we take measures for sin. So now, I just, as, we, as we think about the absolute holiness of God, and, and we all, in either our own personal lives or through viewing it in the lives of others, we know the destructive nature of sin. I, I pray that as we come to, to 1 Corinthians 5 and hear what Paul says, that we will think that what Paul says is, is so radical. But maybe we would think, no, that seems just normal and right. So before I read, read for us the first part of 1 Corinthians 5, let us, let us pray. Father, I pray that you would give us the grace today to Lord, that you by your, by your spirit would open our eyes, illumine our hearts to see the holiness that you possess, that you are a God of holiness and righteousness. 
So Father, as we deal with these words of Paul, may we may we remember what Christ accomplished for sinners like us. That that because of our sin, Christ went to the cross to die. He experienced the wrath that was meant for us because you, O oh God, are holy. So Father, I pray that you would give us a hatred of sin, a love for one another, and a willingness, even when it's completely culturally against everything that we do culturally in our society, that we would be those who gladly practice church discipline. Father, I pray that you do this by your power, the power of your spirit in our lives. So we'll begin by, by looking here at the first part of, of 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And Paul writes, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans. For a man has his father's wife, and you are arrogant. I should not rather to mourn that him who has done this be removed from among you. So here, I, Paul is dealing with a specific people. He's writing to the church in Corinth. And he's writing to a church that has a man in the church with a specific sin. So what I want us to understand here is we are, what I hope, applying principles, all right? Because I, I, I don't assume there are any of you who are, who are currently practicing incest, right? And so this isn't a particular sin that I want you guys to focus on. Rather, I want you to focus on how Paul approaches the church for their lack of doing what they ought to do. So what is this man's sin? Uh, it is some form of incest. An incest that's so vile and so disgusting that it wouldn't even been practiced by the pagan Roman culture around them. Now, we're not sure exactly what this looks like. So it, it, the way that it's worded, it says that a man is with his father's wife. So presumably it's not his own mother. But we can assume that his mother is no longer in the picture, whether because of divorce or death, and his father has remarried. And so now this man is in relationship with his stepmom. It could be that the father has divorced her. It could be that the father has died. Or it could be that they are in an adulterous relationship. We just were not really sure, right? This church in Corinth would have been fully aware of the sin of this individual. We're not sure exactly what it was, but we know just from our own being, our own conscience, that that would never be appropriate or just in society. We would never expect that a, that a boy would eventually do something like that with his stepmom. And yet this is what we see here. And Paul has become aware of this, right? So the idea here is that this, this sin is not a private sin. This is a sin that has spread within the community of this church so that people are aware of it, and they're not doing necessarily what they should do. And some individuals have said, hey, Paul, we have this going on in our church, and we need some help. We need you to give us some guidance on this. Now notice here that Paul says that they are, in the midst of this, an arrogant church. Now, we're not sure exactly what he means by arrogant here, right? And the reason being, it could be one of two things. One, the Corinthian church was a very arrogant church. They were filled, it was filled with prideful individuals. We know this because there were factions in the church, and you had the faction, we follow Jesus, we follow Paul, we follow, we follow Paulus, and they're all proud. There's no sense of humility or unity. They were all divided, and they were always arguing with each other because of how proud they were, right? And so they could be attacking that pride. But in verse 6, we're going to see that they're also boasting. But there may be a different arrogance here. And the second reason is the one, I, is the one I'm more inclined to think, right? So if we, if we look at the writings of Paul, especially like in Romans 6, we know that if we take the gospel of Jesus and twist it, we can get some really sick things, right? So if we have this gospel that Jesus died for our sins, and in the glory and the beauty and the grace of Jesus and God is demonstrated by that, 
And, and we know that we are saved, not through our own efforts, not through our own work, but we are saved merely through trusting in what Jesus has accomplished for us. Then if we twist it in a very wrong way, we might have this idea that we should just keep on sinning. And in fact, the more we sin, the more gracious Jesus is, and that makes Jesus look bigger. All right? And Paul in Romans 6 says, no, 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 no. Don't think that way. That is wrong. Okay? And what I think we see here in this Corinthian church is they're saying we are such a loving community. We're such a grace-filled community. We are so kind and compassionate that we know this brother is in a really bad sin, but we're so loving, we don't even feel it. We're just so kind and so compassionate. We just meet people where they are, and we just accept them. We don't expect anything of them. We're not going to hold them anything. We just want to embrace them and love on them. Man, we know he's a sinner. We know what he's doing, but we're okay. We are such a gracious and kind church. I think that's the imagery we get here, okay? That they, they think that they're righteous, and they think that they're gracious, because they're ignoring this grievous, terrible sin of this individual. And Paul's saying, you shouldn't be arrogant, you should be mourning, you should be weeping. One, you should be weeping over this individual who's in this desperately terrible sin, but you should also be weeping that you're such a defiled church that you're not even addressing the sin as you should. And he says, let this individual be removed. Then we come to this next section where Paul, Paul gives this instruction for how to remove this individual. In verse 3, it says, For though absent in body, so this is the idea that uh, Paul is writing to them, he's not present among them, he's not in the fellowship with them, I am present in spirit. Right? And so he is present with them in a spiritual way, though not a physical way. And as at present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled, in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present, with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. All right, so the idea is that Paul has pronounced judgment. He has already recognized the sin of this individual. It appears that this is a wide known spread, so it's, it can be assumed, I think, that people have gone to this individual to rebuke this individual, and this individual is continuing in this sin. And so Paul is saying, if I were present among you as I am in spirit, I have pronounced judgment. I have cast my vote for this individual to be removed. All right? He says, so when you're assembled in the power of the Lord Jesus, you are to do this. All right? Now, I think what we see here is that Paul is following Matthew 18. Right? So Matthew 18, when we think about the church, this one, this is typically the text we go to, because this is like more of like the instruction manual. 1 Corinthians 5 is more of like, this is why we do it. 1 Corinthians uh, 18 is more of like how we do it. All right, so let's, let's look for just a moment at Matthew 18, starting in verse 15. It says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother, right? So, so when someone sins against us, it's our responsibility to go and to seek reconciliation with that person. For us to go and say, this is the sin you've committed against me, and I expect that you will now repent of that sin. Okay? Now, in Paul, with Paul and 1 Corinthians, we're dealing with, with sexual sin. Big, big sin that has become widely known. That's typically not the majority of sins that we see in the church. The majority of sins we see in the church are, are between individuals. Just, just like my kids get in arguments and fights, right? And they say things that are unkind, they do things that they shouldn't, it, it kind of becomes known and festers. They, they're loud. Well, sometimes when adults do that, we do the same thing, we're just a little bit better at it, right? So maybe we gossip about someone in the church, but it's not loud, it's quiet, and it's Slowly it circulates until it gets to that individual, right? And when that individual finds out, that individual doesn't need to be like a child who shouts and screams and, and complains, but rather that individual should go to the person who said it and say, hey, you have sinned against me. You have, you have committed a vice against me. You need to repent of this, right? 
And there are times when, when even restitution needs to be made. Right? If, if the sin has some sort of financial or physical harm done, then there may be need, need to be restitution. And so one person goes to the other, and, and hopefully that person admits that what they did was wrong. They, they grieve over their sin. They show genuine repentance of that sin. And they, they reconcile. He then has gained a brother. But that doesn't always happen. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. Right? So, so now he takes some people. So people who oh, might be even familiar with this. And, and this is, you've got to be careful because you don't want to be gossiping. But, but maybe if something has, if some harm has been done to you, you go and you say, hey, you come with me and, and you come with me. So this, this is what my, this person has done to me. And this person needs to repent of this. You go and talk. And so, so those other two individuals go with you. And they, they ask the person, this is what this is what he said has happened? Is this in fact true? Is, it, is this happened? Or is this still happening? Right? And, and the purpose here is what? The purpose is reconciliation. The purpose is to, to gain that brother back, to bring harmony back into the church. And so then there's this pressure on this individual. Now you've got not just the one person, but you've got two or three people here saying, hey, you really need to repent of this sin. You really need to stop doing this. Sometimes they still don't listen. So we come to verse 17. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. Right? And this isn't gossip, but this is there's an unrepentant sin. There's something going on in the church. There's something that's causing problems. The whole church needs to be made aware of it. And again, why does the whole church need to be made aware of it? It's not so we identify and isolate that person as a bad person. It's to bring repentance out of that person. That's always the goal. The goal of church discipline is always repentance and reconciliation. But if he refuses to listen, listen, and if he refuses to listen to the church, let him be to you a Gentile and tax collector. Okay? You, you spit him out. You no longer allow him to participate in the life of the church. You, you treat him like a sinner. I think this is what, what Paul is encouraging this church to do. It, it seems that individuals had to have gone to this man and called him repentance. He refuses to do it. And so now Paul is saying, when you gather the church next time, when you gather in the name of the Lord Jesus, and I with you in spirit, in the power of the Lord Jesus, you are to remove this individual from your church. Right? Notice the language that he uses here. To deliver to Satan. Right? You're to deliver this individual over to Satan. Now again, I think if we, if we deal with this in a, a cultural standpoint, this sounds too much. Like Paul, you're, you, you've gone a little too far here. Because as a culture, we just don't like discipline. I mean, we just look at the way most children are being raised in our society now. Families don't like discipline. We let children do just whatever they want. And if we're going to let that happen at a family level, it's no wonder that it infects the church level. But what does Paul mean here by delivering him over to Satan? Some have proposed that the idea here is you turn him over to Satan so that Satan brings about great physical, emotional, financial, social harm to this individual. And, and the example that he used is Job. So we remember the story of Job. Job was a man of prominence, a man of fortune. And everything was going right for him. Satan came to God and said, you know, no one has that kind of commitment to you. And so God hands Satan, or Satan hands Job over to Satan for this time of testing, a time to show Job how good and faithful God is in the midst of all of that but also as an opportunity to demonstrate the absolute glory and power of God, right? But I don't think that applies here because Job wasn't being disciplined, at least in the text. There's nothing there to assume that there was some sort of sin in Job's life, and so this was a testing season for Job. So I don't think that's what that means. Rather, what I think it means is that the world is under the influence and power of Satan. So when we look at society at large, we know that Satan is the one who rules over them. And therefore, for us who are in the church, we are given <coughs> special privileges and protections from the evil one. 
things that the world doesn't have to. And so this delivering over, I think, has the idea of putting him out of the church so that he is no longer receiving the privileges and protections that Christians receive as a part of the church. What we call here, what we have here is, is excommunication, and I'll look more specifically at what it means to be excommunicated later. But this idea of removing. Now again, and, and, and I pray not for us, but for some, this just seems too much. And there are churches that just refuse to do this. And ultimately, I think it's because too many Christians have a low view of the church. The church is Christ's bride. The church is the holy building being built up for the glory of God. The church is God's family. See, this is the imagery we looked at some weeks ago when we asked the question, what is the church? The church cannot be this stained and marred and ugly thing. This, the church is something that is beautiful. And if we're unwilling to discipline those who are Christians, we have a low view of the church. So we are to, to remove them. And this removing from the God's covenant community is meant to bring misery into this person's life. That's the purpose of it. But why would Paul want this misery in this person's life? Because he says, for the destruction of his flesh. And so some have, again, had this idea that what we really want is for their, their, their little flesh to be injured somehow. But Paul never uses the word flesh like that. When he speaks of our body, he uses a different Greek word. The Greek word he uses here is like, we wage war against the flesh. And the idea that there's this sinfulness in us that we're constantly waging war against. Paul wants this individual to experience great turmoil and suffering in their spiritual life so that they do what? Repent. They repent. They long for the glory and the goodness of Jesus Christ in the midst of God's people so that they're like, I can't take it anymore. I can't take being removed from the church. I can't take just being wholly committed to the way of the world because I long for the glory and the beauty that's found in the church. It's always about repentance and reconciliation. That's why Paul wants this. Notice what Paul says, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. I don't know if Paul has ever met this individual, but Paul loves this man. This is a man who has incest with his mother-in-law, and Paul loves this man. And he loves him so much that he's saying, you need to excommunicate him from the church that he might suffer greatly in this life, but so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. So, reconciliation is the goal. Now we turn to the next paragraph, starting in verse 6. Your boasting is not good. Again, I think this boasting is, they're, they're acting like they're such a good church, and that's why they're excusing this, this grievous sin. Do you not know that a little leaven Leavens the whole lump. Cleanse out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Now, now I'm a baker. You, you don't want me in the kitchen. I, my kids said I can cook one thing, and that's bacon, and I still don't cook it as well as my wife. All right? But, I don't know, a year ago, I don't know if it was, was it, I can't remember, part of the COVID world or whatever it was, but my wife fell in love with making sourdough. And she would have this leaven, and she'd feed the yeast and do all this stuff with it. I don't really know what's going on. All I know is that you add just a little bit of that, that, that stuff she kept in a pot, and it, she added that, and it made everything good. So I like it. I like good leaven bread, all right? And the reality was is that she didn't have to add all of that stuff that she keeps in the jar. She just added a little bit. And it leavened the whole lump. It made the whole lump have leaven in it. The reality is, is, is sin in the church spreads. And that's why it has to be rooted out early. 
So, so you guys call me a teacher. Now, I'm transitioning to teaching online. So one of the things I'm looking for about teaching online is when they're all in like little Zoom boxes, if they shout out, you can mute them. That's a glorious thing. <laughs> now, I'm going to miss the relationships and those sort of things that, that are going to be difficult to build with online students. But when you're in a classroom with 30 kids, what happens when one child in that class shouts out? Three other have to respond. And all of a sudden, what was a perfectly quiet and orderly class turns into chaos, right? Because why? All those students, they know they're not supposed to shout out, but when one does it, it makes it so much easier for everyone else to. And sin's the same way. Sin's the same way. When, when I have a sin in my life that I know that my brother or sister has sin in their life, it makes it so much easier for me just to be like, well, it's just one. And I know they're doing that. And mine's probably not even that as theirs. And it makes it so much easier for us to, to ignore the holiness that God calls us to. Because that sin, it just festers, it grows, it multiplies. It's like a disease. And it, and it ends up leavening the whole lump. And notice what he says here. He says, clean out the ugly, clean out the leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. Paul's saying, like, you're not trying to fix yourself. That, that's not going to happen. But he's saying, discipline in the church, because you are already unleavened. Why? Because Christ, the Passover lamb, has already been sacrificed. And that's why in the church, we try not to use the word sinners when referring to ourselves. It, it doesn't mean, it, it surely means, I mean, come spend a day in my house, you'll know that there's still sin in my life. I, I'm not perfect. We won't get there until our glorification. But we don't call ourselves sinners. Why? Because that is not our standing before God if we are connected to God through Jesus. We are saints. And so what Paul is saying here, he's saying, stop doing these things, stop acting this way, get out that, that leaven, because you are already unleavened. Christ died for you, Christ has made you new, Christ has made you holy in him, act like you are. Be what you are. That's what he's saying. He's calling us to be who we are because Christ has died for us. So get rid of that malice and evil. The problem, the things that cause problems among us, get rid of those and rather have sincerity and truth. Be genuinely who you are in truth. Don't let sin fester among us. And so now we come to verses 9 through 13. And I think these are the more difficult ones to quite understand how we apply these today. So he starts by saying, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Right? So if there's someone sexually immoral, don't associate with them. But then he clarifies this in verse 10. This is important. Not at all meaning the sexually immoral of the world or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. Okay? I think he, I think he, he wrote that with a little bit of, of humor. Okay? In the same way there was a little bit of chuckling, I think Paul probably wanted that. Right? He's saying, I told you not to associate with the sexually immoral. Don't associate with slenders. Don't associate with the greedy. Don't associate with idolaters. But I'm not talking about out there in the world. Out there, they are sinners. We should not be surprised when we go out into the markets and into the streets and into the world and we find people doing really bad things. They know no better. They are sinners. We expect them to sin. But what he's saying is, in the church, when you have individuals like that, don't associate with them. Don't spend time with them. This is, a, this is what we see in Jesus, right? What do we see in Jesus? Jesus is going, and who is he, who is he having a meal with? Who is he spending time with? Sinners and tax collectors. Who is he not spending time with? Self-righteous, sinful Pharisees. Jesus was more than willing to go out and find the most destitute of society and spend time with them. Because they weren't claiming to be 
righteous. They weren't claiming to be holy. He loved them. But the Pharisees, who were equally as defiled, who was equally as sinful, using God's word to undermine God's word so that they could continue in their practicing of sin, he wanted nothing to do with them. Unless they showed genuine hunger, genuine thirst, genuine desire, as in Nicodemus. But he didn't want to associate with them. We must be the same way. We are not to associate with those who bear the name of brother or sister if they are in unrepentant sin. He says, don't, don't even eat with them. Don't even have a meal with them. This is, this is hard. And I'll admit, I want to say, Paul, oh man, I'm with you. But this is hard. Because this is when we get to the nitty gritty of life. Right? What is he saying here? He's saying that if a brother or sister bears the name of Jesus, they are claiming to be a Christian, they're claiming to be a, a member of this church, and yet refuse to participate in the righteousness of God. They refuse to acknowledge their sin and repent. You are to disassociate with them. The word, the, the theological word is excommunicate. Communicate means the idea of to, to speak, to have a relationship, and you're to exit, get rid of it. I, now, I'm not sure how we put this into practice. Now, and, and I, as a pastor, do not lord over the church as the chief and minister of church discipline. In a classroom, I do. Classroom students behave and send them out the class. Okay? The church is not, is not ran that way by the pastor. The church itself has to do this. This is why Paul says the next time you guys gather, excommunicate them. Remove them from the fellowship. Not the pastor go do it. It's the church does it. But I, it's difficult. If we excommunicate someone because they remain in unrepentant sin, does that mean we stop them at the door and we say you're not welcome? That's difficult, right? Maybe not. But it probably does mean that when individuals in the church are passing out the Lord's Supper, if we know that that individual has been excommunicated, we don't let them touch the plate. It probably means that when you call up a buddy and say, hey, you want to go get coffee? You want to go watch a game? You want to go do those things? If it's an excommunicated member, you don't do it. You stay away from that individual. And why is it? The purpose of it is not just to be mean to this individual, but the purpose of it is to make sure they understand the severity of their sin, to exile them from the community of faith so that they long to come back. We want them to come back into the fellowship, but they can receive no fellowship so long as they remain unrepentant. That's hard. And I, I would be fully happy if God allows me to, to pastor here for 30, 40 years, and we never have to do it, wouldn't that be glorious? Amen. But we live in the real world. And Paul tells us that there are going to be those who come to the church who cause problems. And we have to be ready for it. We have to be ready for when we have to do the hard work of discipline. No parent likes spanking their child. No parent likes sending their kid off to a room by themselves to listen to them cry. No parent likes that, but a good parent will do that. A church does not enjoy discipline. There are times when we'll have to do it. When we have to be ready. And so, notice here that Paul says, we are responsible for judging the church. We don't judge people outside the church. That's not our business. Now, that's not to say that we don't fight for injustices in society. That's not to say that because we are Christians, we don't worry about things like abortion and other, other injustices in society. We still speak to those. But we are not called to judge the world. It's far too easy for us to do that. Far too easy for us to concern ourselves with the, with the sin of the world. We spend all of our time talking about them out there and not enough time talking about us who are in here. These, us, are the ones we're called to judge. Again, it's not me. I'm not a little bit elevated right now, but I'm right on the same level as you. We are all responsible for church discipline. There may come a time when someone sees something in my life, and you have to come to me and say, Pastor, I see this, and I'm worried about this, I'm concerned about this, can we talk about this? And you may have to call in me to repentance. I'm not perfect. We're not perfect. But a church who loves each other will practice discipline, and we will purge the evil person from among us. 
The reality is that Christians need Christians. We saw this at the end of James. James chapter 5, verse 19. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings a sinner from his wandering lane will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. That, that's what's at stake in church discipline. The Bible is clear that those who persevere to the end will inherit eternal glory. But those who don't persevere don't get it. And that's why we are called to do this. Yes, church discipline is harsh sometimes. But it's way better than hell. But we must also take the seriousness of the purity of the church. When Paul says at the very end of this chapter, he says, purge the evil person from among you. He's quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 17. In Deuteronomy chapter 17, Paul, uh, Moses rather is giving his second giving of the law, and, and he ends this way. So you shall purge the evil from among your midst. He says this at the end of verse 7 in chapter 17. What came right before that are the instructions on capital punishment. When you become aware of someone doing some grievous sin in the community of Israel, and you find out about that sin, and you have two or three witnesses who know what that individual did, you bring them before the congregation of Israel, you judge this individual, and you bring this person out for a public stoning to kill this individual. And guess who throws those first stones? Those people who were witnesses of the crime. They grab the stones first, and they throw the stones at the individual to kill them. And then the whole assembly picks up a stone, and everybody together kills that individual. Why? Because if, if sin isn't rooted out, it spreads. And what do we see in the whole history of Israel? Unrepentant, uncorrected sin that leads to what? I mean, in the, in the period of the judges, it's just constant unrest and un, 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 unrighteous living. That enemies are coming and attacking them and attacking them and attacking them. And for a little while they act like they're righteous and they do some good things. And God relents and then they do it again. What do we see in the period of the kings? Just unrighteousness and unrighteousness and unrighteousness to the extent that they get exiled. They get forced out of their own homeland. And if someone had practiced church discipline, if someone had practiced national discipline, if someone had stoned those people like they were supposed to, maybe it would have never happened. But that's the severity. Paul is quoting a chapter in Deuteronomy when the purpose is to kill the individual. It's a church. We don't do that. There's a separation between the law given to Israel and the purpose of the church. We do not kill. Right? There's not any stonings on Sunday morning. Okay? I assure you that. But we must purge the evil from among us. We must preserve the purity of our church for the testimony of Christ. If we want to be an effective church in a rather godless area of Sedona, where people are looking for spiritual things in all the wrong places, if we want to be a light in this community, it starts with purity among ourselves. We cannot be faithful witnesses. We cannot be faithful lives. We are clouded with impurity. And so that's why church discipline matters. It's for the salvation of the sinner, to drive him to repentance, to drive her to repentance, and it's for the glory of Christ and the fulfillment of the gospel. Father, we rejoice and give you thanks that you are such a good and gracious God. Father, what we've, what we've heard today, what we've read from your word, it's hard, Father. It's hard. pray that you give us the grace to do that which is right in the moments we need it. We pray that as we are out in the world, that you would give us the words and give us the boldness to share the good news of Jesus with those who don't know you. That we'd be willing to endure the shame and the mocking we might receive. But Father, even in dealing with things in our own day, Lord, I would, I would be very glad if you would preserve us and deliver us from, from 
happy to practice church discipline for decades and decades to come. But Lord, if you allow it to happen, may we do that which is right. Give us the grace to do that which is right. God, we love you and we praise you. Thank you that Jesus died because of your holiness, because of your love.